Hey everyone, welcome uh, to the first webinar, Getting Started with ML. Apologies for this shoddy getup. We are all working for, from home in this crisis. Today we have with us Dr. Satoshi Goswami, and he will be giving you an introduction to this vast world of machine learning. Dr. Goswami is one of the well, one of the most decorated faculty I have ever seen. I would tell you that much. He is one of the faculties at uh, CU. He is also a member at data science uh, organizations. Now, the next thing you will see that will be Dr. Goswami's uh, screen. And for the remainder of this webinar, I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Okay, I I hope you can hear me. And uh, if you can see my screen, uh, please let me know. Okay, so uh, actually, just give me a moment. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, let me uh, get started. All right. Uh, so basically, you know, I, I am going to talk about two things today. So one is that I'm going to talk about you know, machine learning problems, okay? So how they're different from uh, problems in your traditional computer science. And uh, then we look at different types of machine learning problems. And then in the second half, I will try to give you a roadmap that if you really are interested in this field, how should you, you know, prepare for this journey, okay? So let's get started. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, thanks Avik for uh, you know having me here. Okay, and also thanks to Professor Shilpi Bosch. And uh, uh, this is a little bit about myself. So I have done my uh, BTech from NIT Jaipur and then MTech and PhD from University of Calcutta. And before joining academics, I have worked in organizations like Tata Infotech, Cognizant, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. So mainly uh, my working domain has been data warehousing and business intelligence. So, you know, you can tell that I was always one of the data guys. And then last uh, seven plus years, I'm in active teaching and research. So these are some of the community initiatives. So uh, I am part of an initiative called a Society for Data Science. So we arrange, uh, we arrange a uh, flagship conference uh, named as ICDMI and uh, so that that will be the fifth edition uh, you know to uh, 2021 so they were in uh, two were in pune one was in malaysia then uh, one was in new delhi so this time we will have it in kolkata of course a lot of uncertainty due to the pandemic situation and uh, sports also offers uh, membership and internship uh, opportunities so you can look at this particular uh, uh, site i will give the slides to obik so he can distribute Okay, another uh, important initiative is called as ODSC. Uh, the full form is Open Data Science Conference. So this is an initiative to bring together practitioners who will talk about open data platforms, open data products. Uh, so this is also a very fantastic opportunity started in 2014 from Boston. Uh, so it has different, you know, uh, meetup uh, groups across India and uh, Kolkata also happens to be one of the cities. I think there are five cities. So Kolkata is also one of them. So we lead this initiative of ODSC chapter. And then uh, in the University of Calcutta, we have our own data science lab. 
where I uh, work as one of the lead researchers. And uh, it is a part of also this laboratory for interdisciplinary statistical analysis, which is the short form is LISA, <coughs> which is headed from University of Colorado Boulder. Okay. And my uh, research interests are mainly in feature engineering. So, you know, this is where I have done my PhD. And then uh, some of the works that we're doing are on natural language processing as well as time series forecasting. There are also some more tasks that we are doing, okay, on, on you know, social data mining and uh, going further into natural language processing. So, you know, if you look at my Google Scholar profile, which is given here, you can find more, okay? So you can definitely get in touch with me through LinkedIn and any other platform. And we will be happy to answer if you have any specific questions. Okay, uh, so uh, let us, you know, let us start with an example. So let's say you want to write a spam filter using traditional programming techniques. Okay, so what is a spam filter? So spam filter basically takes a program as an input, or uh, sorry, an email as an input, and it classifies whether the mail is sent for a commercial purpose or it is a normal email, personal email that is being sent to you. Okay, so you know right now that there are so many spam emails that come and also you know that right now uh, Gmail already tags it as spam emails or promotional emails, right? However, let's say you want to write a computer program which will do that. How will you go about it? So probably what you will think is that you will try to look for words which will tell you that these are for commercial purpose, right? So you know, it will always have something like free or it can be something like discount, maybe something uh, with popular products, maybe credit card, maybe movie ticket. So you may try to find patterns like this, right? So you'll write a uh, program and you will try to find such a list of words and you will count that how many times those are words are coming. If they are beyond a certain threshold, you will mark that email as a spam email or a commercial purpose email okay promotional email all right so uh, is there an issue uh, the issue is that as you understand that you need to come up with a list of such words okay so that may not be very easy to come up with okay so also the list is long and hard to maintain which will make your program also long and the spam spammers can try to outsmart you, okay? Uh, so they are always one step ahead of you. They are smart people. So this is the reason, you know, this, this won't give you good results. So if you follow this kind of a strategy uh, and represent this through a flowchart, so what happens is that, you know, you, uh, you study the problem, all right? So here, when I say study the problem, you are studying the problem of, classifying an email as a spam or normal email, okay? Then you write rules, okay? So write rules maybe that you count the number of free words, you count the number of the word discount, like that, okay? And then you evaluate. Evaluate means you have a set of emails given to you and from that set of emails, you are trying to find out that how many times or how you are going right, how many percentage times you are going right. So that is your evaluation. If you're happy, okay, so you launch this in your production. If you're not happy, then of course you analyze errors, you see where you are going wrong, and that leads you to study, study the problem further so that you can, you know, be, uh, write better rules. So that's the idea when you implement it without machine learning, okay? So when you use machine learning, what happens is that you study the problem, okay? And you see that there is a change that has happened here, right? So you don't have the right rules part anymore. Rather, you have data and you are training some algorithm which is actually giving you the rule. So this is where, you know, there is this difference, okay? So let us uh, look at another problem and then I will try to summarize the general characteristics of such problem. Okay, so another problem is that you have, you know, handwritten digits, okay? So someone has written and the image has been captured. 
So your algorithm takes the images as input and it has to classify whether it's a zero or one or two. That is the problem. Now here, the issue is that, uh, you know, uh, you see that there are a lot of varieties. Look at this five, right? Look at this five and this five. So there are a lot of varieties. So you cannot really have a fixed set of rule or, you know, you cannot hard code the image and uh, you can get the proper digit classification happening, right? So if you look at this couple of uh, problems that we discussed, one of the thing that uh, that is common is you cannot come up with a, a fixed set of if and then uh, rules, right? So you cannot come up with if and else rules very easily, okay? So let's say, you know, you want to calculate uh, the interest rate in a bank, right? So you look at what type of account it is, how much money is there, and how what is the tenure of the money being in the bank. And then there is a set of rules. If you follow those rules, you can calculate the interest, right? However, when you are uh, using, or when you are looking at this kind of problems, there is no such if then else blocks. Okay, so that is the most important thing. So similarly, if you try to take an image and want to classify it as a cat and dog, same problem persists, right? So there is no fixed set of rules, right? So this is where you apply machine learning. There is another problem where you apply machine learning, uh, where you have a lot of choices available. So what do I mean by that? So you must have you know, booked uh, app-based cabs, okay? Of course, not in, uh, now, maybe you know before the pandemic. And uh, you see that, a car is allocated, right? So if someone tries to allocate you the optimal car, you can understand that there are so many requests simultaneously getting generated uh, from Kolkata or from a locality. And then, then there are so many cars available, right? So maybe, you know, if you think of number of options, if, you know, 200 people are applying, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, trying to book a cab and there are, you know, 50,000 cabs. So this 2,000 into 50,000 or maybe the other way around uh, will be a big number. Okay. So assigning the optimal car when the number of options are very high, then also you apply machine learning. Okay. So these are two principal areas or two principal use cases where you apply machine learning. Okay. So if you think to, uh, you know, differentiate machine learning with traditional programming. So, you know, uh, in, in your traditional programming, what happens is that you give the data, you already have the program written and you get the output here, okay? Whereas in machine learning, what happens is that you give the data and the output, the computer comes up with the program. So what is the, uh, what is the characteristics of the program? that if you use this program, okay, and uh, you uh, give this data to the program, it can give you the correct output, okay? So as example, you will give, uh, you'll give the emails and also the output. So they are normal email or spam email to the computer. And it will, it will give you a model or it will give you an algorithm or it will give you a program which will uh, which when given a new email, which is not, you don't know the category, it can tell you what should be the category, okay? All right. So now let's look at some formal definition. So formal de definition uh, comes from Arthur Samuels. So he is one of the, you know, forefathers of machine learning, okay? And uh, uh, the definition goes like this, that machine learning is the field of study which gives the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So the key word that is to be noted is explicitly programmed. So this explicit program is related to the if then else blocks that I was discussing, right? So Arthur Samuels is also credited to come up with the first intelligent program. So there is a you know little story about him, okay? So, Arthur Samuels was a very avid checker player, okay? So checker is a board game, if you know, okay? And he, like, loved uh, crazily to play this game, all right? Uh, and uh, 
you know he was a very intelligent person so if he'll play with someone you know that there is more chance that arthur samuels will win and who loves losing right so it turns out that after some time arthur samuels completely ran out of people uh, who will you know play with him okay so he thought that uh, let me write a program which will play with me so can you guess that what happened when when he wrote this program and he played with uh, the program no arthur samuels only won okay so then what he did was he actually you know let uh, the program play with itself for quite some time okay so uh, once that uh, you know went on for some time and then arthur samuels played with the program the program defeated him so this is not only one of the stories you know many such incidents right so in 1997 uh, there was a program developed by ibm uh, named as deep blue okay so this deep blue program actually was a chess playing program and that actually beat the then uh, chess grandmaster or chess world champion gary kasparov okay so that created a when a lot of frenzy at that point of time later on even ibm is credited with another thing so ibm came up with a product named as watson okay uh, to celebrate their centenary year and watson was their founder so watson was kind of uh, kind of a you know human consultant so it can actually you know read through documents and understand it can look at a video and decipher it can you know look at a sound and decipher so it has lot of this cap you know capabilities and there is a very famous quiz show named as zero party so it participated with human contestants contestants who has won the competition earlier and uh, it participated and it could beat the human compet competitors right so these are some of the landmark uh, you know uh, events that has happened okay so you can google up and read more one more formal definition it uh, comes from tom michel so his is one of the you know best selling books in machine learning okay uh, the definition goes like this a computer program is said to learn from experience e with respect to some class of tasks t and performance measure p if its performance at tasks in t as measured by p improves with experience e so don't like get too bogged down with this definition uh so i i will also admit so when i read it first time it looked complicated basically it is talking about three things one is experience okay because all these machine learning problems needs to learn from the experience okay the experience will be coming from data okay so this we are denoting as e and they are of course trying to excel at some task be it identifying spam emails or be it winning at checker games right so that is the task right that playing a checker game or i or identifying a spam email and what do you mean by performance measure so you remember that you have uh, something like a evaluate at the end so this is the evaluate part so you are actually testing that when you are training the model so let's say you know you you have you have 100 emails given to uh, the program as an experience and then when you give it 20 uh, emails for for you to classify uh, the program can classify maybe 12 of them correctly right so then your classification accuracy or your uh, your uh, you know performance measure you can say is 60% because 60% cases you are actually identifying the email correctly now let's say i give it more experience i add more emails as training emails okay from 100 i take it to 500 so now in this 20 emails uh, this uh, i was identifying 12 emails correctly now you can identify 15 emails correctly so from 60% your performance measure has improved to 75% are you getting it so these are the components and we will further understand this with couple of examples so let's say you know you are at a uh, uh, 
cancer identification problem. So this heading is wrong. This is not check a learning problem. This is, you know, cancer identification problem. And you have a tumor. Uh, so tumors, you know, different thing can be there. It can be a, you know, uh, needle, uh, 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 needle in script. And then uh, you can actually uh, take different uh, measures of the cell or you can take the image of the tumor and, and you have extracted some characteristics about that. Now, uh, the performance measure is the percentage of tumors correctly identified, all right? And uh, what is the training experience? A database of tumor with their labels. So the most important thing is these labels, okay? So you will have to give it the tumors and their labels in the sense that whether they are benign or they are cancer, okay? Similarly, when you are doing a handwriting recognition learning problem, so you are trying to classify handwritten words, of course, your performance measure is percentage of words correctly classified. However, your training experience is, yeah. Actually, I got a message that, you know, my uh, screen is not shared. Uh, so to me, it was uh, showing uh, it is shared, but let me uh, do it again. Uh, okay. Okay, let me just check that. You know, you can see it. Just give me a moment. Okay, uh, so I am not sure from where uh, you could not uh, see my screen because all the while it shows me um, that a, a stop sharing option. So uh, it, I was under the impression you can see it. Anyway, uh, so basically we were talking about this P, E, and T. And uh, here the task that we are talking about is handwriting recognition problem. So where you are trying to recognize and classify handwritten words within images, okay? Uh, so maybe something like CAPTCHA. The performance measure is percentage of words correctly classified. And training experience is database of handwritten words with given classification. Given classification means that an image is given and what is the correct word that is also given, right? Uh, all right. So now let's look at type of machine learning problems. So, uh, you know, uh, you have classification type of problems, which comes under supervised. You have regression type of problem, which comes under supervised. So basically, you know, there are four types, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement, and semi-supervised. And uh, the most, uh, most interest is in this area of supervised and unsupervised. There is some interest now getting generated in reinforcement. And also there are some use cases or, or applications of semi-supervised learning, okay? Uh, so supervised learning can be further classified into classification and regression. We'll discuss about them in a while. And we'll also uh, discuss a couple of types of unsupervised learning. All right. So this is your classification problem. So what happens is that you have got an image and its labels. Okay. So this is called as labeled. So please remember that supervised problem has a particular thing to predict about, okay? So here, what you want to predict is that if a unlabeled instance comes, 
you want to predict it whether it is a duck or it is not a duck okay so uh, please let's go through this once more this is probably one of the most important concept uh, so you have label data you have the observations and their labels available okay and as the labels are available you call it as a supervised learning okay and once you uh, you make your model go through this supervised learning it gives a predictive model as an output okay so once this predictive model is ready what you do is you give you can give it is an unknown instance and it can classify itself as a duck okay or label it as duck so this is how a classification algorithm works important things to note is that there are two phases this is called as the you know training phase this is your prediction phase okay where you are actually doing the prediction now uh, also it needs label data and please understand that there is a fixed set of category so you have dark and not dark so you if you suddenly you know give a ostrich and you expect that it will your model will give the output as an ostrich so that will not happen okay so it's no magic whatever categories you are giving as labels this algorithm will classify them to either of these two categories all right okay so th there are further terminologies so this is another example okay again very uh, well used or abused example where we are talking about a scenario uh, you know uh, there are different weather conditions and whether the weather is conducive to playing golf or not okay so this is the target field similar to your dark and not dark okay so here also if you see that there are two uh, you know possible categories or two possible values yes and no okay so just for your knowledge this type of problems are called as binary classification problem as there are only two classes if you have more than two classes you call it as multi class classification all right okay so you know these are your attributes and based on these attributes you are going to uh, assign them a label all right uh, so these are called as these are called as independent variables these are called as predictors and this is called as a target variable this is called as label this is also called as class variable okay so these are few terminologies as far as classification is concerned okay so regression only thing that gets changed is the value that you are predicting okay so earlier you know you are predicting a string a string is called as a categorical variable whereas in regression you are predicting a continuous valued variable a numerical variable based on the other variables okay and you can assume a linear uh, model or a non linear model uh, this is also studied a lot in statistics and neural networks so one of the example can be the predicting sales amount uh, based on advertisement expenditure okay so sales amount you can understand will take some value in you know inr okay uh, so this is a continuous uh, continual running field okay uh, so it can be predicting win velocities some of my students were working on sports analytics okay so they worked on a problem that in a ipl auction okay so what should be a good price for a player okay so this is available uh, as a conference paper if you want to look at you can definitely look okay so but the idea is uh, that uh, you are predicting a, a, a variable which is continuous in nature okay let me share another example so they are also a uh, few of my students were working and they were wanting to uh, predict box office return of a movie okay so box office return of the, of a movie you can understand is uh, is a continuous field right uh, so it's a regression problem but this was a you know typical case where we needed to convert this regression problem into a classification problem okay uh, so what happened was so if you really you can understand that out of regression and classification you know which needs more precision can you tell me can you think about it so the regression needs more precision right so uh, we we saw that we were getting only 80 to 90 movies the records that we are interested at so basically we were uh, uh, interested mostly at the social buzz it is creating 
and we wanted to predict whether the movie will be a box office failure you know before uh, the movie is really released to the theater based on its social media responses okay so at that point of time we could only consider <clears throat> uh, that point of time we could only consider the facebook okay and uh, we intended to cover the teasers in youtube and all but you know that that point of time we could not do it however what we saw is that when we are doing a regression our results are going quite far off so what we did instead is we converted this into a classification problem three classes less than 50 crores 50 to 100 crores and more than 100 crores okay so these were the three classes and when we then train we were getting and and, and actually we evaluated our model we are getting more than 80 percent accuracy right 83 84 percent accuracy okay all right so this this paper is also available okay you can uh, read it up now let's come to unsupervised learning and one of the most important categories of unsupervised learning is that uh, it is uh, one of the most important categories is clustering okay so if you compare the pictures of classification and clustering looks very similar right so what's the differences the differences are first difference is that you don't see any labels over here right so no one has written this is a dark this is not a dark right okay that is the first thing and uh, that's why you call it as unsupervised because there is no label to supervise your algorithm and it tries to find natural groups within the observations so what should be the characteristics of such groups the characteristics of such groups will be that uh, within the group that they, they will be similar and between the group they will be quite different okay so if you look at here so the ducks are similar but they are different from this rabbit or this porcupine right okay so uh, do you agree with this kind of grouping okay can there be any alternative grouping probably yes so you can group them you, you can group these two uh, also in the same cluster so these are called as clusters okay so in clustering algorithm one of the one of the most difficult challenge is coming up with the optimal number of clusters okay uh, so we have discussed about this in depth in you know different uh, different lectures which i will talk about in a while uh, but you know this is one of the problems when you face a clustering algorithm Another important uh, category under unsupervised learning is called as market basket analysis. So the rules that you use here is called as association rule. So basically you want to find out, so you analyze a shopping basket and you try to find out that, you know, uh, which, uh, which products sell well with other. So that can help you, you know, put uh, products uh well or organized products well in your uh, shopping mall that is one and then uh you can also think of proper discount strategies so as example you always know that you know bread and milk sells well sells well together or maybe bread and cheese sells well together so if you put a discount on cheese you will not put a discount on bread okay all right and then uh, there is another thing which is the recommender system okay uh, so probably you know it is it is the most growing field of uh, machine learning right now okay uh, because you know this is where uh, this is where uh, actually the big companies are putting money into okay uh, so if you it, it is everywhere right so if you are in youtube right so if i log into my youtube it will show me some video that i should watch okay so this is a recommendation okay as example it shows me that introduction to ica and fast ica okay uh, because i was i look at a lot of machine learning algorithms okay and it also shows me uh, some something from kapil sharma's show so maybe uh, i admittedly or not admittedly watch them also quite a lot okay uh, so this is a recommendation that that is always there in youtube in google uh, in uh, facebook facebook they are recommending you friends right 
linkedin they are uh, you know recommending you uh, more connections all right okay and if i log in you know in a incognito mode what happens is that you, if something uh, you know comes like why i stopped playing pubg okay so uh, interestingly when i am in incognito mode and when i am uh, with my original sign in the recommendation changes okay so that makes the recommendation uh, you know system uh, so interesting to study about all right so how it works basically so if you look at this diagram so basically i see that uh, this user is similar to this user how do i find this find similarity between users is a is a you know involved question so i am not answering it here uh, but let's say some way i know these two users are similar so this uh, person has you know taken this product this triangular product named a this pentagonal product b and this square product c and this person who is similar has taken a and b but he has not taken c so far so i'll recommend this product c to this person okay so i just see that okay uh, this person likes action genre movies uh, this person has watched five movies out of this five this person have watched three movies so you recommend the rest to to this person so this is the basic idea and at a very broad level okay at a very broad level uh, you can classify the recommendation system into two categories uh, which are called as collaborative filtering and content based filtering okay so collaborative filtering is as i was discussing that you first find out that you know uh, both these users like action genre movies so they are similar users now this person has liked this movie this person has not watched this movie so recommend this movie to this person okay all right similarly uh, in content based what happens is that uh, you know that this is a this person has liked a comedy comedy genre movie okay and uh, you find similar movies to this uh, this movie and then you recommend this to this user so uh, at a broad level uh, you know you can think it it is it is uh, working on user based similarities whereas here you are looking at similarity between items however collaborative filtering also works with item based similarity but let me not you know confuse you further on this uh, we can i can recommend you lot of uh, further reading on recommender system okay uh, if you are interested now let's come to reinforcement learning so uh, reinforcement learning the best example is you know uh, learning to bicycle okay so learning to bicycle uh, basically there is an environment right and you are trying to find a set of uh, you know set of policies if you think or set of behaviors <clears throat> by which you can you know cycle without getting down or without falling down okay uh, so here uh, uh, here if you look at this example this uh, robo is interested to find a policy to collect water without getting burned okay so that's that's his uh, you know uh, objective and what it does it so there is an environment here so environment gives feedback right so you know if you go to this place then you get a penalty and if you or punishment or if you go to this place and can collect the water okay then you can actually get a reward so the robot can find out uh, a optimal policy or a good policy so that it can go and you know get the water from here okay uh so uh, reinforcement learning is is very much used in artificial intelligence okay uh, especially uh, it has lot of uh, you know lot of uh, uh, lot of application as far as automation is concerned so maybe it, it is robots or maybe it is autonomous cars so everywhere you cannot really even <clears throat> the environment is more uncertain than machine learning okay all right so now let's go to semi supervised so semi supervised what happens is that you have lot of data available okay but you don't have you have only some part of it labeled okay uh, so what you initially do is you start with the label data and then you have this unla unlabeled data so you label them right so that's what you do normally in classification right 
So now there is a second step. What you do is you call them as pseudo label data and you already have label data and you retrain your model again. Okay. So the question is that why should you do that? Okay. Uh, the idea is that, you know, any model will learn better if you give it more data. Okay. So in this case, as I said, you have less amount of data. This is a strategy where you actually want to increase your training amount or increase your training data. Okay. Now you might ask me that, why do I not do it every time? Right. So every time I can do this. So there needs to be some property of the problem when you can apply semi supervised because, uh, you know, uh, Otherwise, there is no, you will always apply the semi supervised technique, right? So uh, it goes like this. So, one of the areas where it is used a lot is called as, you know, speech recognition. Okay. Speech recognition you get in all your, uh, you know, home uh, assistants, right? Uh, Alexa, Siri, and all that. Uh, so, uh, where when you pronounce something, it has to relate it with a word. And you can understand that. It is not possible. So I will pronounce it in one way and someone else will pronounce it in the other way, right? Same word. Okay. So what happens is that, but there will be some similarity, of course. So if I, if I, if I utter this word pronouns, okay. And I label that, okay, this is the audio clip and this is the label pronouns. Okay. So when I try to label it and let's say now Avik pronounces or utters the word pronouns, Okay, I see that, okay, there is some similarity between these two utterances. Okay, so I label Obhik's utterance also as pronouns. Okay, so I am not, I am not trying to label something which is completely unheard. I am trying to label or pseudo label only those which are similar to what I have already there. Okay, so uh, this is also a very interesting field and is only applicable for some of the domains. Okay. So before, before, you know, we, we, uh, stop, probably we will have to look at, uh, you will have to look at the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Okay. So right now people are going gaga over deep learning. Okay. So, you know, they are the ma major of the community's interest is in deep learning. Okay. So at a very high level, at a 30,000 feet level, what is the difference? Okay. So this I have already, we already have seen. So one thing that uh, I have not discussed is that there is some kind of feature extraction that is involved when you are doing a machine learning. So if data is available in a tabular format, which you call it as a structured data, okay, you don't have this step. However, if you have data like image, if you have data like text, if you have data like audio, you have this feature extraction phase. And then you do a classification. Okay. So you convert this data into a tabular data, then you classify, and then uh, you can give the output. So this step is often very, very difficult. Okay. To come up with a good set of these are called as handcrafted features. Okay. So these are very difficult. In deep learning, if you see, you don't need to worry about this feature extraction phase. There is a lot of layers involved lot of layers involved, which does the feature extraction and classification together. Okay. Uh, so this, this is where the main difference is. Okay. Uh, so just to summarize, you know, uh, so in terms of learnings, we can, we can think of this having uh, supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised and reinforcement. So supervised data has to have node labels. So you can have insurance underwriting. So uh, what should be the insurance value of certain risk? Okay. Uh, fraud detection. Okay. And unsupervised labels are not known. So you are trying to find patterns. Okay. Find groups. So it can be customer clustering. It can be, you know, market basket analysis, which we discussed. Okay. Semi-supervised labels or outputs are known for a subset of data. So it's a blend of supervised and unsupervised. And you can, uh, you know, use on medical predictions. You can use on the, the, the uh, case study that I talked about. Reinforcement is focused on making decision based on previous experience. So here we are focused on policy making. Okay. 
so you know these are used in game yeah so these are used in game also these are used in complex decision problems as i said it can be autonomous car okay or it can be used in reward system so basically you know if you are designing even even uh, you know something to do with your uh, casino system so they are also you know reinforcement learning can be used okay uh, so quickly uh, can you tell me which requires ml so as i said interest rate calculation right so there is a fixed set of if and then else rules you don't need ml here right identifying credit worthiness of a customer there cannot be a fixed set of rules right uh, you can have some intuitions but from your data you need to come up with a model so this is where you will apply machine learning okay inventory management of pharmacy again there are fixed set of rules you know when to order there are uh, you know what amount to order okay so these these are the things uh, you can uh, you, it, this this doesn't of course require machine learning whereas you want to find high risk patient you know there is again there may not be any you know if then else rules you have to look at different body vitals okay uh, they are maybe family background okay so from there uh, you can identify high risk patient okay so this task will require machine learning all right so now let's come to the second part so this i will not take more than uh, more than maybe 5 10 minutes so how will you make yourself a good machine learning professional okay so the first step is of course to learn programming and right now the programs that are predominantly using or being used in machine learning are python and r all right and uh, this is a generic rank from ieee spectrum okay not for machine learning and you know it it ranks basically what are the top programming languages okay uh, so this is 2019 list and there is a type so this type basically tells that python can give you you know with python you can come up with web interfaces you can come up with desktop applications you can come up with embedded applications within a chip or a micro micro uh, microcontroller or you can also come up with a mobile uh, device application so python supports these three modes and python is right now the top most popular programming language r is fifth uh, so please remember that you know the, this list is not for only machine learning okay but in spite of that r comes in fifth and not only that uh, among the top 5 if you see it only supports one type of application which is the desktop application okay uh, closely followed by javascript Uh, so purposefully here i don't talk about uh, too much about implement uh, like uh, creating the user interface around your machine learning problem okay but there you know javascript also can play a role uh, how to get started you can look at data camp there are several good programs you can look at simply learn you can look at udemy so these are some of the you know uh, good uh, channels you can go by for learning the language okay uh second step so this is where you know many people falter okay so you need to learn the necessary math so what are the necessary math component so you have uh, you have linear algebra you have probability you have multivariate calculus then algorithmic and complexity which you can put in data structure and algorithm also and maybe some other parts however you know this linear algebra and matrix Uh, and probability are the most important part uh, so basically you know uh, first of all as you are dealing with the data so data comes in a square format which you can thought as a matrix and then you can apply different interesting linear algebra properties okay and <clears throat> secondly uh, when you look at uh, probability so probability is because it is an uncertain world right so you cannot fixly say that okay a uh, probability of having the email as spam is 100% no you can only say with certain confidence so that's where you know probability is important multivariate calculus will be important because if you remember that what you want to do you want to maximize so you remember about the performance measure you want to maximize the performance measure and from your high school you definitely remember that uh the maximum value 
you can find by taking derivatives. So that's where you know calculus comes in. And algorithm and complexity, as I said, I, I will put them more into probably computer science. Okay. How do you do that? So you can look at Khan Academy, you can look at Coursera, you can look at NPTEL. <clears throat> so what I've seen uh, so far is, you know, Coursera, NPTEL, Udacity, these are more towards theoretical courses, all right? And Udemy, Simply Learn, Data Cam, they are, they are more on hands-on, okay? But, but you know, if you, you are an engineer, right? So you will have to understand the theory also well. So these, uh, these are also very important for you. Then coming to the computer science part, learn data structures, give a special focus to graph. So there are, there are a lot of areas where you can model a problem as a graph problem and apply different properties of graph. Okay. You can learn, uh, you need to learn algorithms and especially approximate algorithms. Approximate algorithm means that these has a time complexity, which is exponential in nature. To put in simple terms that if you want to find the result, okay, optimal result in your lifetime, you will not get the result if you write a simple algorithm. So there you need to use some kind of a heuristic, okay, some kind of an approximation basis, okay. Uh, so these comes, uh, these are also called as meta heuristic algorithms. Uh, there are very beautiful books, very beautiful lectures here. And this is also one of the uh, places where people are not very, very aware. Okay. So this can be also one of the opportunities you can in cash upon. Okay. Uh, again, you can look at Coursera, Udacity, edX and NPTEL to learn about them. All right. Next is that read good books and research papers. So I talk about some books. Okay. Uh, you can, if you, if you, you know, come to me, uh, uh, you know, offline and discuss, I can tell you several other books. So right now, the best book in machine learning is probably uh, by Aurelio Geron, okay? Hand on Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn, Keras, and TensorFlow, okay? Um, uh, so next, I will put as Introduction to Statistical Learning. So this is, so he uh, was, I think, one of the lead engineers in YouTube, and then he became uh, a CTO of, of some other uh, startup, and... Uh, Introduction to statistical learning is by uh, two statisticians or a group of statisticians in Stanford University. So this uh, book is written with Python. This book is written with R. So that's why you have both the theory and the hands-on uh, together. Uh, this is an old book by G.V. Han uh, named as Data Mining Concepts and Techniques. Okay. This is also a very, very, you know, well-sought, well-cited books. Not so much read like these two books right now. However, uh, is an excellent book, okay? And uh, uh, I will also recommend you this book, Introduction to Computation and Programming Using Python. Uh, so this is by John Gutag. So he is a professor from MIT. And uh, just a minute. Baba, I want a class to tell you. I want to tell you about Okay. So... Uh, this is how, you know, uh, uh, this book is not about uh, just, uh, you know, learning uh, to program in Python. So it talks about how to go about computation, how to go about programming, and then it talks about Python, okay? And uh, finally, I talk about reading research papers. So, you know, a lot of these theories comes to books, okay, uh, at a later point of time. And this is not, you cannot you know, start reading research papers from today if you don't have a habit. Okay, so once maybe you go through these books and you start with some, some basic research papers, you will get a good hang. What, why should you do that? So the two things, you will, uh, you will know the cutting edge research, which are not flowed to the textbook. So you'll ahead of your peers, right? And then if you can implement those methods or you get some idea to come up with your own methods, probably, you know, that can really set you apart. Okay. And of course, then you apply. So you apply to data science competitions. So you can uh, look, uh, look at Kaggle. You can look at driven data. You can do, look at analytics Vidya. So I think Kaggle comes at the top and I will give like, you know, 90% weightage to Kaggle. There are beautiful data sets available, beautiful competitions available where you can learn from other people's work. You can actually have some real life data. Okay. Do as many projects and internships as possible. 
okay so any like get any opportunity you you know try to get into projects ask people that they can, they can give you internship okay and then write research papers okay so you know these are some of the you know guidelines that i would like to uh, tell you okay and uh, of course finally network attend meetups okay uh, and uh, attend uh, webinars okay become member of societies coding clubs study groups so you can be member of ieee scm i talked about uh, the meetup group uh, odsc kolkata uh, just google by odsc kolkata meetup you will you can join our group you can see the past lectures that has happened you will come to know the you know uh, recent uh, lectures that are going to happen okay <clears throat> and uh, you can become member of society so society for data science ieee scm you can be a member you can be member of coding clubs there are a lot of international study groups okay so you can be part of the study groups create your own linkedin and github profile okay so this is also very important okay and volunteer once you know you have got some good idea volunteer to give talk give give back to the community so that way you will will network you can also get get a lot of feedbacks that you know where uh, you can go right or you can correct yourself okay so i think you know that that brings us to the closer of this okay and i will uh, hand over to avik now so if you have any questions we can take them or i'm not sure if in this platform you know that can be done okay Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I believe we have one doubt. It's from uh, Anandita Mukherjee. She asks, uh, "What requires ML uh, slide in that slide? What was the second point of her interest calculation rate?" Okay. So let me just go back to the slide. okay identifying credit worthiness of a customer uh, so this this you, you know uh, it is a, it is a quite old problem where we try to find out whether we should give loan to a customer or not okay uh, so so this is the problem i was talking about you cannot really have a fixed set of rules that if he has this much of take home salary and uh, you know he has already this amount of loans or not these are his number of family members so you cannot have a direct if then else rule okay for now i believe that concludes it there are no live doubts okay, okay. so once again uh, so uh, thank you sir for giving us this honor to host you we hope you will be uh, giving us once more this honor and would help us uh, Propagate yeah, yeah. this knowledge so, among our peers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple of uh, things that I want to say further. Okay, one is that you know, uh, if we could uh, do in some like this is a very good platform, of course, because this doesn't need any browser and all. But one of the problem is as as you know, teachers we we love to interact with students. Okay, so if we don't hear them, uh, this monotone is very you know very difficult okay uh, and 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 there are a lot of um, like the slides are also designed that way so i can engage i can interact okay so that is one of the things and uh, then uh, also uh, i would uh, like to talk about uh, our youtube channel so uh, i uh, abhik if you if you have that uh, please share with the participants or you know i can share yeah yeah so so we have put together i think right now there are more than uh, close to 45 uh, lectures available okay and uh, you have all our social coordinates i will give my slide to uh, abhik so he can you know circulate with all of you okay and then uh, please go through them I, we would uh, very much love you to welcome you to this machine learning community okay so you can learn further you can ask some questions which you know uh, makes us read more and learn okay so that's all guys thank you so much once again thank you sir
I hope everyone enjoyed this series. This, of course, is not the last one. This is actually the first one. And uh, yeah, so for those who are uh, eager to give their attendance, the form is live right now and they can sign up. Uh, before we conclude, I would once again like to thank sir. Thank you, sir. We hope again Thanks, you will be giving us the honor to do so. And uh, yeah, I would personally encourage everyone to subscribe to Sir's uh, machine learning uh, channel. It's actually one of the best channels I have ever seen, personally. Uh, Thank you, Avik. The Thank link so is pinned to the live stream. I hope you all enjoyed it. This concludes it. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah.